a Dead Sea Scroll prophecy in Enoch explained all of human history from creation to the second coming to the millennial reign of Christ and all of this apparently before the flood. In 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were uncovered and in 1948, the nation of Israel was born in a single day. Did that ever strike you as unusual that two of the greatest spiritual events in the past 2,000 years happened within a year of each other? Was this accidental or a sign? It strikes me as very unusual. It is almost as if something very important spiritually happened in the heavens and on earth in that year. And in those Dead Sea Scrolls was the Book of Enoch, a book that is non-canonical, not inerrant in other words, not part of the canon of Scripture, but which contains one of the most incredible prophecies of all time. In Enoch's chapters 91 through 93 is the prophecy of the 10 weeks. If you've read this prophecy before and don't understand it, it might be because you don't understand how Enoch's calendar worked and what those 10-week verses were about. But once you do understand it, it is absolutely incredible explaining all of human history from creation to the second coming to the end of the millennial kingdom and the white throne judgment itself and explaining when all these great events in history would happen. Now, you might say, wait a minute, this is a non-canonical book. It isn't inspired by the Holy Spirit, is it? Well, certainly some of Enoch is inspired. The book of Jude, chapter 1, 14 through 15, is a direct quote of Enoch 1.9. So there is at least one inspired verse, and the Bible quotes more than just that one verse. Did you know that? So after you see this video and see all the things that the book of Enoch got right and in the right order and in the right century, you should ask yourself and wonder to yourself, how could this portion of Enoch not be inspired? How did Enoch know when Abraham would come? How did he know the century when Israel would be recreated as a nation? That just is something he couldn't have just guessed. But as we said, it requires knowing how Enoch understood time and where these weeks come from. According to the Essenes, Enoch was one of the testimonies of the patriarchs, one of about 20 to 40 books that supplement the Bible. They aren't scripture. They aren't to be trusted like scripture. They help us to understand what scripture is saying and what prophecy is saying. In this previous video, we explained how significant the Dead Sea Scrolls were that contained these testimonies of the patriarchs. A link is down in the description. Now back to Enoch. Enoch believed that from the creation to the end of the millennial kingdom would be 7,000 years. Peter believed this as well, as did the Apostle John, the writer of Hebrews, who is probably Paul, and so do I. We discussed this in detail in this other previous video from a couple years ago. Its link is down in the description as well. The best ancient explanations of this 7,000-year doctrine, however, are found in two other non-canonical books, the Epistle of Barnabas, from somewhere between AD 70 to AD 130, and Irenaeus's book Against Heresies from about 125 AD. Although they're non-canonical and may not be inspired, they explain what early Christians believed. And we will then look at the scriptural references that support this as well. Then, when we're all on the same page about the 7,000 years, we'll dig into Enoch and see how this is related to his prophecy of the 10 weeks. That's our plan. So here's what Irenaeus, a former bishop of France and a disciple of John's disciple Polycarp, had to say. It's based on the idea that each millennia, or 1,000 years, is actually a day, according to God, as found 
in Psalm 90 and in 2 Peter 3.8, and that eventually, at the end of the 6,000 years since creation, Jesus will return. It teaches that the seventh millennium, the seventh 1,000-year period, is actually called a Sabbath millennium, in which Jesus will ultimately set up his perfect kingdom and allow his followers to rest. That's what it says in Revelation. So here is Irenaeus against heresies from book 5, chapter 28, paragraph 3. For as many days as the world was made, and that's the creation event, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. And for this reason, the scripture says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their adornment. And God brought to a conclusion in the sixth day, the works that he had made. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. This is an account of the things formerly created as also is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of the Lord is a thousand years. In six days, created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the sixth thousand years. Very interesting. I mean, he was very clear about what he believed. Barnabas put it this way. Give heed, children, what this meaneth. He ended in six days. He means this, that in 6,000 years, the Lord shall bring all things to an end, the day with him signifying a thousand years. And this, he himself beareth me witness, so he's saying God said this to him, almost prophetically, saying, behold, the day of the Lord shall be a thousand years. Therefore, children, in six days, that is 6,000 years, everything shall come to an end. And he rested on the seventh day, this meaneth, when the sun shall come and end and abolish the time of the lawless one and shall judge the ungodly and shall change the sun and the moon and the stars, then shall he truly rest on the seventh day. Barnabas 15, 4 through 5. Now those are not inerrant scriptures, but in the inerrant scriptures, John refers to this thousand year kingdom as the millennial kingdom. The writer of Hebrews refers to this thousand-year day of rest as well. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. For if Joshua had given them rest, then God would not have spoken of another day later on. So there remains, future tense, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Hebrews 4, 3, 4, and 8. Both of these refer to a thousand-year-long day, and the writer of Hebrews calls it a Sabbath, the seventh 1,000-year-long day. Peter brings all this together in his second epistle. The heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. So Peter here is talking about the creation event and adds, but by the same word, the heavens and the earth are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. That's the day of the Lord. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day, and this means one day in the creation account that he was just talking about, is to be a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. But the day of the Lord, again, he's talking about days throughout this whole thing, will come like a thief in the night. 2 Peter 3, 3, 4, 8, and 10. Peter says this is to correct those who wonder why Jesus didn't return in the first century. Peter's answer is because the timetable for his return is for him to return 6,000 years after creation, not back in the first century. Well, where did Peter get this idea? Maybe from God. Where did John and Paul get their ideas? Again, maybe directly from God. But the answer could be from Enoch, from the prophecy of the 10 weeks. Let's do some simple math. If there are 7,000 years from creation till the end of the millennial kingdom, and if the book of Enoch divides this 7,000 year time period into 10 divisions or weeks, then each division or week is approximately 700 years long. Now I say approximately, 
Because as you look at this prophecy and we begin to study it, you're going to see some weeks seem longer or shorter than an exact 700 years. So they're divisions of major events, not really a division of years. Ten major events, but on average, each week is about 700 years long. And not understanding this is why so many struggle with the 10 weeks prophecy. So let's see how this works and begin in week one. Enoch begins to recount from the books and said, I was born in the seventh of the first week while judgment and righteousness still endured. Enoch 93.3. According to Genesis, Enoch was born in the 622nd year of creation. Now this was during the first week of 700 years, just as the prophecy is predicting. Here's what the next verse says about the second week. And after me, there shall arise in the second week great wickedness and deceit shall have sprung up and in it there shall be the first end. And by that Enoch means the flood and in it a man shall be saved. And that's Noah. And after it is ended, unrighteousness shall grow up and a law shall be made for sinners. The law, I think, refers to the Noahide laws. Now, the flood appeared 1,656 years after creation, according to Genesis. And if the second week was strictly 700 years long, you can see how this wouldn't work. That's only 1,400 years. That's how we know the weeks refer to major events, not strictly to a calendar of X number of years. Now, the next verse, Enoch 93, 5, in the third week refers to Abraham and the creation of a, something he calls the plant of righteousness, which is a symbol for Israel. And after that, in the third week, at its close, a man shall be elected as the plant of righteous judgment, and his posterity shall become the plant of righteousness forevermore. Abraham received a promise that his offspring will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. These are the ones that this prophecy is talking about that will become something called the plant of righteousness. In the fourth division or week, Enoch 93.6 speaks about the Exodus and the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And after that, in the fourth week, at its close, visions of the holy and righteous, meaning God, shall be seen, and a law for all generations, an enclosure shall be made for them. The children of Israel saw the columns of smoke and fire, and Moses spent time with God up on Mount Sinai. That's how the visions of the holy and righteous were seen. A law, of course, was given to the land of Israel, the Ten Commandments, and an enclosure was given to them as well, and that probably was the land of Israel itself. The fifth week, speaks of the building of the temple in Enoch 93.7. And after that, in the fifth week, at its close, the house of glory and dominion shall be built forever. <laughs> what could be more clear? In the next verse, the sixth division or week speaks of Jesus' ascension, the apostasy that caused Israel to not recognize him and the destruction of the temple. And in the sixth week, all who live in it, and they're speaking of the holy house, shall be blinded, and the hearts of all of them shall godlessly forsake wisdom. And in it a man shall ascend, that's the ascension, and at its close the house of dominion shall be burnt with fire, and the whole race of the chosen root shall be dispersed. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Enoch was written about 250 BC to 200 BC, according to experts, long before the coming of Jesus and the destruction of a temple. Everyone who thinks the 10 weeks prophecy was just invented based on previous events and then added to the book have to ask themselves, how did this precise record of what would happen in the first century regarding Jesus' ascension get written 200 years before it happened, unless God gave the prophecy. To me and my thinking, there is no other explanation. This had to have been a God-given prophecy, either to Enoch 
or to whoever was writing the book of Enoch 200 years before Christ. This is the point in the prophecy where everyone has to stop in amazement. If Enoch knew about Jesus the Messiah in advance, what else did this writer know? And it's wonderful to have insight like this and what we're going to see in the rest of this video, but it is more important to know what to do in response to insight like this. That's why Last Days Overcomers is holding a series of conferences throughout the USA in 2023 and beyond to spend an entire day instructing Christians on what to do in the end times and just as importantly, answering all those deep, heartfelt questions you have about the last days. A day where you get to ask anything you want. We have announced our first three conferences in Cincinnati in June, Arkansas in July, and Minneapolis in August. And by the time this video airs, we will probably have one or two more to announce. So down in the description below this video is a link where you can get your tickets to those events both to the live events in Cincinnati, Springdale, and Minneapolis, and the online events for those living elsewhere who want to participate but just live too far away. All these events have limited seating, so get your tickets as soon as you can. Now, back to Enoch and its prophecy. In Enoch 93.9, in the seventh week, we learn, and after that, in the seventh week, shall an apostate generation arise, we believe this is the current Jews, or maybe Islam. And many shall be its deeds, and all its deeds shall be apostate. And at the close shall be elected the elect righteous of the plant of righteousness, to receive sevenfold instruction concerning all his creation. This week considers time, you know, from approximately AD 30 and Jesus' ascension to AD 1000, it speaks of the division of Christians and Jews into two separate camps, the elect, who are Christians, and the apostate. What is this sevenfold instruction the Christians are given? Could it be the coming of the Holy Spirit? That's my guess. In the next verse, we learn about the eighth week, from about AD 1000 to the building of the third temple in the end times. We are living in the eighth week right now, in my opinion. And after that shall be another, an eighth week, that of righteousness. And a sword shall be given to it, that a righteous judgment may be executed on the oppressors. And sinners will be delivered into the hands of the righteous. And at its close, they shall acquire houses through their righteousness. And a house shall be built for the great king in glory forevermore. Now, the house for a great king just about has to be the third temple, it appears. But the rest of this week is a bit hard to understand. I certainly don't imagine today as righteous, as a righteous day. But if we think about the previous centuries, it was the greatest time of missionary sending of all time. Perhaps the houses that are acquired are churches. So that fits. Maybe the sword is the sword of the spirit that brings the unrighteous to faith in Jesus. Or... Maybe it was World War II and the great oppressors were guys like Hitler who were defeated. So that could fit as well. In the next verses, we learn about the ninth week. And that's from the beginning of the tribulation to the second coming of Christ and all the way into the millennial. And after that, in the ninth week, the righteous judgment will be revealed. And that's Jesus being revealed to the whole world and the works of the godless will vanish from all the earth, and the world shall be written down for destruction, and all mankind shall look to the path of uprightness. So this week concludes with the 70th week and the return of the Lord, Armageddon, and then the millennial kingdom when people begin to look to the path of uprightness. In Enoch 91, 14 through 17, we learn about the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennial kingdom, followed by the judgment of the fallen angels. And after this, the eternal state that exists forever as God first planned Eden. And after this, in the 10th week, in the seventh part, 
that means at its end, there shall be the great eternal judgment in which he will execute vengeance amongst the angels. And by this, he means the fallen angels. And the first heaven will depart away and a new heaven will appear and all the powers of the heavens will be given sevenfold light. And after that, there will be many weeks without number forever. And there will be goodness and righteousness and sin shall be no more mentioned forevermore. It's hard to comprehend the writer of Enoch realizing these things thousands of years ago. Even if it wasn't the historic Enoch, it had to be someone writing before the coming of Jesus and before the New Testament, because we have that from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Whoever it was had to have heard from God himself, because this is prophecy that influenced the New Testament writers. In fact, if you keep reading in Enoch and in the other testaments of the patriarchs, you'll discover answers to mysteries that still plague Bible scholars today. For instance, what or who were the seven heads of the beast? What are the seven mountains that John spoke of in Revelation 17? And what is the identity of the beast empire? Believe it or not, the testaments of the patriarchs, in combination with the Bible, give us the answer. See how they inspired the New Testament writers. Click right here to keep watching. If that earth-shaking video isn't ready yet, another Dead Sea Scroll video will appear till it is. But till then, this is Nelson, and I can't wait to see you there for this landmark video that's coming up.